Hey, 3DMJers, this is Andrea Valdez, and you are listening to the 3D Muscle Journey podcast. Along with Eric Helms, we have a special guest on today's episode, and her name is Amanda Rizzo. Amanda is our team's mental health consultant, and she is our go-to source for any questions or concerns that we might have about our athletes' emotional well-being. In this episode, I'm talking with her and Eric all about a recurring and troublesome topic in many athletes' lives, and that is, what happens when your friends don't lift? For some of you listening, this might sound like a small issue and it's no big deal. For the majority of others, you all know the uncomfortability and frustration that can come from being misunderstood by your friends or family members who don't have similar goals, and how that can often wreck people's lives and relationships. So today, we get to hear about how this problem arises, how your passions can alienate others, why you even need other people in the first place, and what you can do to maintain your own health and well-being as you continue your lifting lifestyle. This episode also presents a ton of useful questions that you can ask yourself to become more aware of why you love your sport so much, why you love certain people so much, and why all of that is worth working for. Eric and Amanda also halfway give my greedy ass a therapy session in itself during this, so my apologies for laying all this out there for you listeners, but as you'll hear, this was definitely a huge pain point for me early in my figure athlete career. Like, I lost all my friends and became a complete jerk, so hopefully you guys can learn something from it and avoid similar times for yourself. As usual, if you have any feedback or comments on this episode, go to 3dmusclejourney.com or to our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash team3dmj and leave it under podcast number 125. Please enjoy our episode titled, When Your Friends Don't Lift, with Eric Helms and Amanda Rizzo. What is up, Amanda Rizzo? Hey, how are you doing? I'm doing well. It's really great to have you back on the podcast. Uh, last time Likewise. we did this, I think I was sitting in Andrea's room with you and Steve. Not this mm-hmm. room, but yes. Living well, room. I, comfy couch. One, of your, one of your rooms. This is you true. You have many. This is also the Andrea, The Andrea Mansion. The Team Brandria yeah. household. Team, team Brandria uh, crib special was what we had going on in the podcast. <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah, I think... This is a really cool topic that I think is really important um, because like few other sports, I think bodybuilding can uh, create isolationism within people and understanding that, recognizing it, know what it might be costing you that you may not even be paying attention to. And even to a lesser degree um, for non-competitors, just people who lift, um, coming into that very new social circle, reading new things online, um, you know, the gym becoming your primary place of expressing yourself or connecting with others or, or the thing you think about. I think it does change your, uh, your relationships a bit. And I think people can struggle with that. And it would be really cool just to get uh, your perspective in this conversation because obviously Andrea and I and, and you as well have kind of the lifter's perspective but knowing what to do about it as a uh, mental health consultant and with your expertise professionally, I think would be a good voice to bring to the table. So thank you for joining us. Yes, definitely. I'm excited. Um, so I will probably have mentioned this in the intro of this podcast, the recorded one, but as I hope our listeners know, we, we recorded a podcast 80, oh shoot, 80 something. It was loneliness and bodybuilding, right? And so it was me, Eric and Bert talking about how we dug such giant holes for ourselves for, I would say, years. Each of us spent a few years. Um, and now I'm looking back, like I was a lowly isolated hermit, but I didn't even, I didn't think of it that way. Like I just thought I was dedicated. I thought I was doing what is necessary to reach the goals that I had. And so, Amanda, if you could start, like, how does someone I- identify loneliness when that it wasn't even in my vocabulary, but I, I was very alone. And in, why is that even bad? Sure. Well, I can speak a little bit of my experience as well, but um, bodybuilding itself is time consuming. When we first start, we're 
definitely so immersed. We, we're excited to get in the gym. We're excited to start this new quote unquote diet. Um, and a lot of things are changing, but we don't realize how it's affecting our lives. We don't realize how it's impacting others, how it's impacting our schedule, our school, if you're in it, our career. It, it can totally derail some things. But let's let's first go ahead and differentiate what being alone is and what being lonely is, because they're two different things. Mm -hmm. Loneliness is more so a state of being. It's a state of isolation. And okay, like I'm alone in this room. There's no one in here with me versus loneliness. That's more so a state of mind where there's an emotion attached to it. You're sad, you're depressed, you feel lonely. So when that happens, when we're bodybuilding, we're starting this off, um, we start to notice that, man, I'm not having these real connections with people. I'm kind of, I'm isolating myself mentally. I'm taking myself away from nourishing relationships. And that's a very important aspect of happiness. It's just having positive interactions with others and just forming meaningful and fulfilling relationships. Mm. Okay. You know, I think I'm, I, I'm li I like the way you phrased that. Actually, both of both of the way so that you guys phrased your experience, Andrea, and then kind of getting the terminology in place because I, the first competition season I did in 07, um, I'd already been married for a year and a half and I was living with Barb and I don't know how self-aware I would have been. I think my self-awareness of some of my changing behavior was augmented by the fact that I got feedback from my wife. Let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. And we, and she was like, you know, you're, you're, you're different. This isn't working. Um, this is what I'm experiencing. And I worry that maybe that would have all happened in a vacuum because I think what Andrea, what what I was hearing when Andrea was describing her relationship with the sport initially was that it basically puts blinders on you. You yeah. become so focused that you don't necessarily see or at least temporarily care about or even see to care about how, how the, the, the drive for your sport is affecting you. I personally, you know, think it's because the food is such an instrumental part of it. And that's, you know, every three hours, it's not like going to practice and being like, yeah, hang out with soccer players. Now it's a little more in depth with that. Um, but man, I was, it, it created a lot of other behaviors in me. I was spending all my time on the bodybuilding forums, even though I was in the middle of doing something else now. And I think it can only be worse now that you have social media at your fingertips all the time. You could be on an Instagram or a, a YouTube channel, uh, looking at bodybuilding type stuff. And it, it certainly has propensity in my experience to really suck people in like that. And I think it was creating social isolation for me or at least changing um, where I could put my energy and time into it that would eventually lead to that. Yeah. Well, and what's, what's cool that we've talked about a lot, and you mentioned Barb, and I know on this, sh this podcast we've talked many times about how our prep doesn't need to affect other people. Or, or a goal, I know that you and Jeff, maybe Bird have said, are like, I want to be able to do a prep without my significant other noticing or without my friends uh, hating me or whatever. But mm. I, I guess... Um, Stealth we prep. Don't, yeah, but we don't think about, is, is it hurting me that I don't have these relationships? Mm -hmm. You know, and I guess that's it is like, I'm by nature kind of introverted. I like being by myself. Like Amanda said, I like being physically alone a lot like I don't need people in my room or in my space but after a lot of years I noticed that um I'm not sure why maybe Mandy you can help me like define this but I'm not sure why I started to feel like oh I'm a different person because I don't have other people in my life like not in a good way mm -hmm. and I guess mm -hmm. as a listener some hardcore peeps or whatever might be thinking well I just don't need relationships but it's like humans do, right? And why do humans need relationships? Right, right, definitely. I would say our priorities kind of shift 
when we first start bodybuilding. And I remember I myself, Eric, you were touching on how you can totally be immersed and consumed when you first start. I remember it, I was in college and in between classes, I would go on my laptop and just look on bodybuilding.com and just look up recipes and different training programs. And then I started to notice I'm different like Andrea. I'm, this, this is really important to me. And other people weren't seeing that. Other people weren't acknowledging its importance because their priorities are different. And or maybe theirs are that, the same, but yours changed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even even that way. And when we're so immersed, we can't or we don't allow ourselves to acknowledge other people's values, other people's priorities. So getting out of that state of mind or just taking time to stop and acknowledge it and recognize where am I at? Where am I at with this? And other people as well. It's, it's difficult, it's difficult to catch yourself in that. Yeah. When, how do you identify a, de, like a, a lonely person? Like, I, I think I identified, um, one, I'm different, like you said. Like, I know that, that my priorities are different than they were a couple years ago. And the, re the reason that, the only reason I think that I got that way is because at the end of my first prep, a couple people were like, hey, you suck now. Like, you're not any fun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, what, you know, like, you never go, at first it was like, hey, you never come out anymore. And then one or two people actually had it talking with me and like, I just don't want to hang out with you anymore. Like, you're irritable you're and I was never like that like I always was like a super fun loving person or whatever and outgoing and if they didn't tell me that um I don't know how long it would have lasted or whatever and that just like started a little seed at first I was resentful and I was like kind of pissed I'm like how dare you guys? right like I'm fucking yeah busy. I was just gonna ask what was your reaction to that <laughs> yeah at first like it hurt but I wasn't gonna tell them that I was more like you just don't understand. Like you kind of said, like you, my priorities are different and you just don't understand. And I kind of like you, Amanda, I was just like in my corner researching and reading and reading. I'm like, I'm going through this change. Um, and I know what I'm thinking or whatever, but because they don't, even if I did tell them, um, they just didn't. So I guess like if, if I'm one of your patients and I go to you with that, I'm like, Hey, my friends told me I'm a different person and I'm pissed about it. Like what could or should I do? First, I would ask what's important to you and who's important. What's it bringing up for you, for those people that are telling you these things, um, that you're different, uh, we don't like hanging out with you anymore, and have that client recognize what it is has, that has changed. So pretty much is they're better off finding out on their own. And like, I'm not going to tell them what it is, but okay. for you yourself to figure out, okay, how, how have I changed? Mm -hmm. How was I before this? What was I doing? What was I not doing? Um, what was my temperament my attitude? And what is it now? Compare and contrast. What was the feedback I was receiving before? What am I getting now? Yeah. So How do you, I feel now? You're asking people to discover all this on their own. I would guide them as yeah, a therapist. Yeah, yeah no, no, that's like, what okay. I mean. <laughs> like, you wouldn't say, like, hey, they're right. You suck now. <laughs> you know, you would actually be like, well, is that true? Why is that? Um, mm -hmm. Do you think that actually matters? Why are, you, why are you getting irritated by them telling you this? Are you be, being defensive? Yeah. Are they pointing something out that's actually true and you don't want to recognize? Yeah. Is that common? Defensive? Um, like what is being defensive? Like when like when they said, Hey, you're different, I'm like, whatever. Like it's because I care. Like what what does being defensive usually mean to you as a therapist when if I guess I tell you the story and I was defensive? Um mm -hmm. what it like what red flags does that bring up for you? That reaction that you just gave whatever you're yeah. dismissing you're dismissing what they're saying without acknowledging it or just weighing whether or not it's true and why is that bad you can 
Well, you would continue in that cycle. Yeah. Okay. How how long were you receiving the that feedback without changing? It's also irrational if you think yeah. about it. Like uh, if if a friend comes up to you and tells you something, normally you would go, "Oh, this is my friend. I consider their opinion. I trust them. I like to think about what they have to say." But yeah. if the knee jerk reaction is "Nope," then that tells you that man, you're not willing to consider that for some reason, maybe because you know it's true or you don't want it to be true. Mm-hmm. That That's my first thought, you know? Yeah. Okay. So the therapist, you're like, oh, shit, this will not fix unless she realizes um, right. the error in their ways. Yeah. Well, Which, I guess again, that's kind of the way all therapy works, right? You're trying to get them to realize that, A, there's a problem, and then help them problem maybe think about it. Yeah. And so that they can continue that later on. And then I'm out of a job. <laughs> <Thanks with them. laughs> yeah. But it's like, I, I guess, um, myself, like I've never had real therapy and I know obviously you guys have or do it as a practice, but, um, as an illustration for those who think like, like I would have definitely, like I wouldn't have thought I need therapy because I thought therapy was for crazies, you know, but I guess um, I would have been a lot better off had I talked to someone about this because, man, I just missed everyone for a long time Mm -hmm. because I was getting the results I wanted. And so obviously what I'm doing is right. Yeah. Mm. It's hard to take an internal look on yourself and recognize uh, kind of not that great in this area. So, I mean, I'm functioning completely fine in other places. So why, why change? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Why change if it's I'm, you know, serving a purpose? I'm achieving my goal, and I'm able to. I'm achieving my goal, and and it's my highest priority. And there might be a cost. The cost is worth it to me. So, I'm going to be fine with ignoring those costs, or accepting them, mm-hmm. or uh, not paying attention to them. And then, it is what it is, kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, uh, I, yeah, I guess I'm, I'm grateful I had Barb around at that time um, because I knew my marriage was a priority, but I did not know that I was affecting it in a negative way without getting that feedback from her. It, You know, the funny thing, also talking about Barb, she was a, a dog trainer for years and then was a, a zookeeper who worked with primates and did a lot of behavior stuff with animals. And the thing that predicts a animal being unhappy or unable to cope or uh, not being able to socialize with others is, is how much exposure they get at certain critical stages of mm-hmm. life and in general to other animals. Like the importance of socializing a puppy or a kitten or having an animal grow up with its, its peers. Like if they don't have that, they don't know when their behaviors are problematic, at least from a social perspective. Mm-hmm. And I think that's the same thing. Like if you isolate yourself as a human who's bodybuilding, you're like, yeah, whatever, I'm still getting my, my goals met, but you're basically retarding your emotional growth and your ability to like interact with other humans. And man, when you look at like weird fringe groups that end up like doing violent things in our society or people who like maintain conspiracy theories or just the people you meet and it's like, wow, you really don't talk to people very much. Mm-hmm they invariably have secluded themselves in some way or limited their social circle to only other people who can't really, who share the same blind spot. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I, I I think to me that that's, that's an extreme version, but I think it highlights the importance of um, being able to get feedback about what you're like when you may not be able to, because it's a blind spot because you have such an intense goal, which often comes in people who seek out bodybuilding and what, bodybuilding kind of uh causes with its its obsessive nature because it's kind of 24 7 right and it perpetuates itself as well Mm. um you know once you get into that that whole isolation phase uh, you know this is my priority uh this is important it's the 24 7 thing um you start feeling like when you go into social situations uncomfortable you're not confident you're not sure of yourself 
and then you start thinking, oh, I'm awkward, or this is awkward, um, I want to get out of here, like, I, I need to go eat my meal, or, wh- or whatever it is. So, and that just reinforces it, that that interaction reinforces the next one, and it it reinforces the feeling like, oh, I shouldn't go out, or I shouldn't interact with people, like, I just, I just need to be by myself, and leave me alone, and let me get these gains. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting how that, and then that can turn into, well, when I go into social situations, I'm uncomfortable. I'm just someone who doesn't like social situations. Mm-hmm. That might be part of it, but it could also just be that you don't ever expose yourself socially, so they're always going to be uncomfortable. Those experiences are going to suck, so of course you don't like them, you know? Right. Yeah. Right. That Like when you, when you quote, unquote, socialize a puppy, like it's, it gets better, right? you know, right. uh, over time. And, and then they actually know how to be a dog with other dogs at a dog park versus being either scared or aggressive or, or hiding or uncomfortable or shaking the whole time. And I guess in essence, we're just animals. So, yeah. Yes. <laughs> so if I decide, okay, so say you're right after talking to you, Riz, I am pretty you're right, I've seen it. Okay, this probably isn't good. Um, my friends think I'm assholes. Okay, like, how would I even begin to fix that, do you think? Like, as a... If I recognize that I've what isolated myself. Change? Okay, so what do you mean by that? What are my options, even? Like, other than changing myself or my relationship. Is that what you mean? When you say, what do you want to change? Yeah, what, what part of the issue do you want to fix um back then I would be Um, like oh I don't know back then I would have been like well I'm not going to sacrifice anything in terms of my sport but I also (laughs) I would like I don't know I don't know I don't know how useful where you were at at that time is for saying what would a therapist do in this situation Andrea because you wouldn't have gone to therapy at that time that's true yeah but I like because therapists don't do things for you they help you accomplish things that you have already acknowledged are a problem and maybe if you've acknowledged overall maybe I need help or assistance they'll help you be aware of new problems that you might be resistant to at first but you're like well Mm -hmm. shit I'm sitting in the therapist's office I'm obviously open to changing like that's been my experience exactly like I go to therapy for x reason and then they go I go in there and the therapist is like well you consider y or z and I'm like listen mf -er. I'm here for (laughs) x don't you dare ask me my parents or, or, or my upbringing or, or point out this other problem. It can't be oh, that. I told you as X, you better fix my X. Uh, and then and then they go, well, hey, why are you in my office? And I'm like, that's a damn good point. All right. So maybe why is a thing, you know? So What are you willing to change right now? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. You know, but even, even now, even then, even, well, not now currently because I'm actually uh, not full on training mode right now, but. Um, at any stage in my athletic career, I don't think I would have been, and in the future, like when I'm, when I'm in a certain mode, I, I refuse to do less, not refuse, but can like, uh, there's these things that get me better at my sport and I don't want to change them. And I realize occasionally a holiday, occasionally a family thing, whatever, but as a whole, I'm not really willing to be shittier at this thing or what I think would make me shittier at it. But I guess I would want to know, like, are there things outside of that that I could be doing? Like, maybe I don't want to give up my sporting shit, but I do know that I would like better relationships or maybe I'm single and would like a boyfriend or whatever. Um, Does that sound fair, at least, Eric? Or do you think that even if I was in that space, I wouldn't be? Well, what things did you have to sacrifice in bodybuilding for your relationship with Brandon Ooh, not to get question. like super no you can't I'm like when you guys were first starting out you man, went from completely he was, no I was isolated. in prep I was in you were prep in, you were in prep yeah um man he was just real understanding well okay he's been in prep before he he understood a lot of it and I guess I hadn't met anyone that had done that 
so maybe that is the difference, right? Is back in the day day, all these friends that were like, hey, you're an asshole because they'd never done what I'd done. And maybe Brandon was a little bit more like, um, it was a person that understood. And so I guess then my fault is like, hey, you sucked at making your friends understand this back in the day. Well, I mean, there is an advantage to being with someone who understands the sport, definitely. Mm -hmm. But the majority of the cases, like, it, it just, it's not like that. Um, yeah. Most partners aren't part of the bodybuilding industry or family members, parents, grandparents, most of your friends. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, Bart didn't even lift. That? Bart, didn't, Bart didn't even lift. Yeah. At that time. So, how do you now start those conversations? Now, now she does. Yeah. How do you start those conversations? Well, they usually initiate it um, by calling you an asshole, right? Yeah. yeah they, <laughs> Or they'll start to notice, like, what are you doing with all of your time? And your response to that definitely contributes to how they're going to receive that message. So if you come at them as like, I'm doing this, you know, this is important or derogatory or insulting. If your response is short, they're probably not going to be receptive. Now, if you... Because people love to talk about themselves. If you yeah. invite them into, they they do. Yeah. If you invite them into the conversation, they may feel like maybe they can help you in a way to achieve your goal. Maybe they can support you better. Just including them more into the conversation would would make it a more positive interaction. Yeah. I, I like how you use the term invite them into the conversation. I mean, that sounds, that has a different meaning than having like the, the talk, like, Hey, I'm bodybuilding now. I'm telling you. Here, yeah. Here's what's important to me. Listen. Yeah. And that these are my priorities now. So what are you going to do with that? You know, <laughs> they, so talk to, to talk to us a little bit about what, what does that look like? What type of emotional stance what what are some of the conversational tools? I mean, some people come from backgrounds where the only interactions they have with their family are fighting or not fighting, you know, and it, it, there's a defense, defensive speech consistently going on. They're they're waiting to be judged, you know, um, and like it's easy for me as a coach to tell my clients, hey, it would be good just to let your family know. And these are some of the things that you might experience and. Here's what you may not want to do. Here's some ways they can help you or, or just, you know, invite them to ask you questions. But the actual kind of when 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 that plan meets contact with the enemy, sometimes it doesn't the, the, the plan doesn't go according to how it was a, I, I intended it to go. So what are some approaches that, that people can use? Mm -hmm. First off, go into the conversation without expectations, because. Mm -hmm we can't necessarily change people. We can't, they have to change for themselves, but we can definitely provide them with the information to make that decision on their own. So answering any questions they have, telling them what you're doing and why it's important to you. What does yeah. it make you feel? And how, how does it make them feel? Consider them. Cause maybe, Maybe they do want to start or they're intimidated by it. So they kind of perceive you as, okay, um, I, I'm, I'm not sure about this. You know, I have all these questions. Ugh, that's just an example, but consider their feelings. Consider your feelings and talk about that. Put that on the table, even though it might not be easy. Mm. So I like that. So coming to it without expectations, I think is so important. Mm -hmm. I know the, the best conversations I've had with people when I'm not trying to lead them somewhere or I'm not trying to, uh, to, to be ready to counter. I'm not sitting there loading my guns while they're talking, <laughs> trying to think about how do I counter X, Y, and Z, you know, right. I'm just coming to the table and just saying, Hey, so I'm doing this, this crazy new thing. Um, 
here's what I what I think I'm gonna expect from my my coach or from what I've read online. Here I, I'm I'm super excited about it. Here's what it means to me. Here's why it's important to me. Versus just just the X's and O's, which I think is a much more emotionally safe place to operate. Here's the the whys. Uh, the whys to me and and the, the feelings I have around it is um, it's a much more risky place to be. You're much more vulnerable. But the, the benefit of that is if you're talking to someone who cares about you, that means that there's a much larger potential that they will consider what you're saying because they are connecting with you, not – and I'm hitting macros. You know, like <laughs> I think that's – they can't – relating to – like if you had – a uh, a friend who was coming to you and they said, Hey, I want to become a, um, a motocross racer. It's really, really dangerous. I might get hurt. Um, they started talking about engine specs and like risks of, of injury and, uh, you know, like your, your training schedule, like sure, whatever. But if you said, man, the, the feeling I get when I'm on that bike, it's mm-hmm. the, it's the, it's the, it's, the, it's, the, it's I've never been so happy. I've never been so exhilarated. I feel like I have a purpose and a goal and it's given me self-confidence uh, I'd love for you to come to some of my races and see it, um, but also I, I, I'm, I'm aware that it's 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 a little dangerous. You might have to travel, um, you know. So how do you feel about that? I think those are two very different conversations, and I Definitely. feel like the latter is probably more likely to go well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and the expectations I think too is like we've we've told a lot of people it's good to have these conversations and tell them what you're doing, but I think a common experience uh, what is it? Expectation would be like, I told them, so they're supposed to accept it. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's like, oh shit, they might not. They might not. Yeah. So then what do you do? Mm-hmm. I don't know. What would you do? What did you do? What did I do? Oh, Cause I'm, I'm sure plenty of people in your family and your friends. You know, my family was real supportive. I, I mean, like, way more supportive than they should have been (laughs) like (laughs) when I'm looking back at it like my parents would take me wherever I needed to get my food every three hours they would um and I wasn't prepping like I just knew I I just I had done my first season and I knew I liked how I looked at the end of that and so I just tried to carry that out for a couple years and so I was almost enabled by them because they loved me or whatever right it was my friend's that I lost, but my family was always real supportive. Yeah. I think the next step, let's say someone doesn't receive the message well, mm-hmm. and you acknowledge, you acknowledge what they said to you, how they feel. You know, I heard you, thank you for your feedback, whatever it is. And I think the next step would just be not internalizing it don't take it personally Mm. per se yeah it's not gonna necessarily mean that you're a bad person but take it in consider in consideration excuse me with a grain of salt and ask them is there anything i could change to make you feel better about this yeah yeah that reminds me of kind of the the conversation I had after my first season with, with Barb, she was like, Hey, I'm all about supporting you. And she was, she Mm -hmm. came to my shows. She did my color. We stayed in the hotel and all, all the, the the whole nine yards. But she also said, this isn't working. And, um, you know, she prompted the conversation with basically saying, I am not okay with this. Um, but very much using the same terminology invited me to to figure out a way that we could make it work you know um and then i think just like andrea i get pretty obsessive and focused and want to optimize the thing i care about but it was really nice to go okay so i so i need to figure out some new constraints within which i can optimize things you know so if, if i know that my marriage is is the highest priority and I want to have my cake and eat it too. That cake being Barb, um, and that has a weird, <laughs> that has a really weird sexual connotation to it. Honey, if you're listening, she I love is a you. snack. I've seen her. She is a delicious snack. <laughs> um, I was about to be like, what are Barb's macros? Anyway, macros, uh, <laughs> of yeah. course. Got to work her in. 
if it fits, right? Oh, so anyway. hey. Uh, okay. I'm, I'm evolving <laughs> okay. back to where I was. So, yeah, yeah. So then, okay, if, if, if this is a really important relationship to me, as are other things that I become aware of now that I've thought about this, then within the confines of ensuring that those aren't sacrificed, what does my plan look like? Because I think optimal without limits is what typically really messes bodybuilders up, and in terms, especially as far as their social relationships. Like if, if, if I don't know, because it, that's not a thing. Right. I think that's a useful mental exercise to go through. Optimal doesn't exist and everything has to have some boundaries for where you operate. So like, do I train 10 times a day? No, that's actually counterproductive. So within constraints of training, nutrition, social relationships, your values, what you care about, then you can optimize it. And I think it's just a matter of um, having those conversations with people you care about to figure out how you're affecting them. And being open to hearing that maybe pretty negatively so that you can kind of recalibrate. At least that's what it was for me. Yeah, both of y'all said, um, what are your, both of y'all have said many times priorities. Like, what are your, and I don't think I, until maybe, it was a good chunk of my life. I never like thought about that. Mm. Like, I, I can reflexively look, like, I can, what's, what's the word when you're looking back? Retro, what's the word? Retroactively. Maybe that when I look back, I can obviously see like bodybuilding was my main priority above all family, all friends, all school, all whatever. Um, but if maybe if I'd made the list and someone asked me like, what's your top priority now? Or like, does this matter more than family? Family? I think I could have said like, well, no, my family fucking matters. But it's obviously it, uh, it wasn't. Your actions aren't yeah. in line with, with your values. Yeah. Um. I just didn't think to do that, which is embarrassing. But it might have also been purposeful because it allows you to maintain your behavior. I, I don't think it's like I'm. Why didn't I think of that? Or I'm a bad person. I think it's that we only know how to do what we know how to do at the time we do it. Right? Yeah. Like yeah. if people could do better, they would. If the people knew better, they'd do better. Right. Sometimes. Yes. And. Most of the time, I, yeah. I think if, if if we assume the person's coming into it with good intentions, yeah. if the person is actively doing something malicious they know is wrong, that's different. But yeah. um, if they had the the knowledge and the will or the means to do better, they typically do if it's something they actually care about, right? Mm -hmm. And I just didn't know how to do better, really, uh, and I didn't know what I wasn't doing right, and I think. One of the ways that some people approach something they really care about is they just they go all in. It's black and white. They just hone on it completely. And then they don't have the mental space, time, energy, and sometimes they purposefully cordon off their attention so they don't think about other things. So asking the question, what are your priorities, that's like asking the question in another language. Like, I, I don't know what you just said right now. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So I can relate yeah. to that. Yeah. Feels bad. It does feel bad when <laughs> yeah. I mean like total dissonance in your life. Cognitive dis dissonance actions, it's just everything's a mess and you're stuck in kind of this vortex of bodybuilding, but you're not fulfilled. Yeah. Or you make your goal of this whatever bodybuilding is and all these other things that you've said are more important are on the back burner mm -hmm. well and saying it now makes more sense right when I say like when obviously I didn't care more about curling than my mom like real real life like I care about her but um you know I wasn't like that's an easy question if someone had said what are your priorities like I just wasn't talking to anyone not mm -hmm. just not a therapist like i I was uh, kind of like you said, I was reading in re every free second, reading, learning, absorbing, learning, learning, cooking, reading, you know, training, like it was all in, but nothing ever went out. Uh, I just never, you know, other than like work and my job, I wasn't having com like real conversations. And I guess mm -hmm. that kind of is the, the vicious circle, right? It was like, like at the beginning when I was like, why do we need relationships? But now I'm thinking, and this is probably exactly how therapy works because I'm learning from talking to y'all, is uh, that could 
me not having relationships kept me from having conversations and conversations are how I got out of it. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think that that's cool. Amanda you should bill me, Riz, for this podcast. You should send me a bill. <laughs> right you up. Uh, three billable hours. Here. Um, yeah, that's exactly what Amanda said. Is it's uh, it's, it's bodybuilding very much can be, be a self perpetuating cycle, and I think yeah. I've seen that a lot. Um, it's funny how we talk about the experience of a lot of our athletes and us is that each prep gets better, but I've definitely seen the opposite where each prep gets worse at the point where now eventually they're no longer mm-hmm. prepping and they're d- out of the sport cause it was unhealthy and wow. destroyed my, my relationships. So, um, yeah, I think that's something I always think about, um, is how much of that is survivor bias when I see people getting better and better at lifestyle bodybuilding and preps is Am I not seeing the people who that wasn't the case for? Because they're not in bodybuilding anymore, you know? Yeah. What are they sacrificing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of people um, that I know, I'm not as many in person, but on the internet, that will say, Mm -hmm. like, it'll be a CrossFitter or a a strongman or a powerlifter or something. There's, like, athletes in these strictly performance-based sports who – will talk shit about when they tried bodybuilding about how bad Mm -hmm. it is um Mm -hmm. and so like like uh like eric said it's like is it was it so bad that they now (laughs) they just had to leave it um yeah yeah that's the only way it wasn't like like with 3d i know one of our things is like we we like to give priority to the off season because we've all experienced that it's much harder than prep. But I guess prep can go so bad or the, I, not necessarily the first prep, the first off season can be so bad that you can't even imagine going back. Mm. I think is what's more common, right? Eric? Cause most people get to the stage. They might not be the best shape they've ever been, but it's like afterwards when they realize how messed up it all is. When you try to go, to go back to normal. Yeah. Yeah, I don't even yeah, it's not even the off season. I think it's the transition to the off season yeah, yeah. that most people struggle with. That's you know, I mean. and yeah. And the uh, to use it to use the word or to use the dissonance, the differences between what you have to do during prep and what you have to do in the off season, I think are really difficult for people to manage. Um I think actually something I'm writing about in a blog is what do we mean by saying that over time your prep and your off season should look more similar? And it's not that you should be shredded and eating the same diet physiologically and in practice, it's not the same, but I think in many ways, the the mindset, the lifestyle you live, the habits you develop, um, start to look more and more similar between prep and the off season. If you're doing it in a way that becomes sustainable, but if you don't get there, you're probably going to end up being that CrossFitter or that strong man or that power lifter who is going, yeah, I couldn't deal with the bottom of the it's lifestyle. That's, that, that's a, yeah. yeah, that's a, a breeding Holy ground for eating, eating disorders. Yeah. That kind of thing. So they, they find another way to express lifting competitively. Um, so yeah, I, I, I just wonder how much of that I don't see. Well, I was going to say, I don't like using the word balance necessarily um, when it comes to bodybuilding, especially prep because uh, there really is no balance. It's an extreme sport. You have to go to extremes. However, everyone else in your life did not sign up for it. Mm-hmm. So what do you have to do? What do you have to adjust in your life to go back to what Eric said, um, making sure that your off season and your prep look similar on the outside? Yeah, that's okay. well said. Just hopping in for a quick reminder that we have recently released the 3DMJ Lifting Library 2.0. The Lifting Library is our all-in-one video course solution to perfecting the essential movements and exercises that every bodybuilder needs to know and execute well. Once you buy this thing, you have lifetime access to the course, which will increase in size, quality, and price year after year as it grows over time. As of now, we've just increased it from 12 chapters to 18 chapters, And it covers the big three movements, split squats, good mornings, pull-ups, dips, lateral raises, calf raises, RDLs, hanging leg raises, overhead presses, and a whole lot more. The library includes extremely high quality video tutorials for every movement, key performance strategies for executing the lifts correctly, and most importantly, detailed programming considerations that will tell you exactly how and why you should include or not include certain exercises into your training program. 
So go to liftinglibrary.com, sign yourself up now for lifetime access, and every few months you'll be notified of when you have new content in your course so you can log back in and build upon your training education for years to come. Again, that's liftinglibrary.com. Go there and sign yourself up for the free trial today. Man, and this is it might be a, a little bit of a right turn, but I th- I'm just curious about it. How much did your personal experiences, because you were talking about them a little bit, with uh, getting really obsessive or drawn into lifting and recipes and, and your nutrition, influence your decision to get into being a mental health counselor? And is there a connection between those two? Mm. If you don't mind that personal question. No, definitely. Good question. Um, I definitely noticed myself isolating from people, not going to events, um, having poor relationships with family members. And people were like, you're different. You're, you know, you, you're off in the gym and you're not here with us. Uh, were you in school then, Riz? Or were you already in school for mental health counseling? When you started getting a little bit obsessed with psychology already. Um, so I had my own therapeutic experience beforehand, and that's that was the catalyst of me wanting to start the psychology therapy route. But I didn't know what. Oh, your experience in therapy. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay, right. gotcha. As a patient. Mm-hmm. As Slash a, client. Yeah, right. Okay. So I, my own experience in bodybuilding, kind of led me to want to work more with athletes. Gotcha. Mm. So that was that was the path of it. So how did you personally deal with that feedback from friends and family that you were less connected and how did you manage that? But yeah, I guess it's, I, I'm curious because now I, I know you're someone who's studied psychology, has done this, helps other do, others, others do it. I, I'm curious about you as a case study. What, what's worked and maybe hasn't worked or things that um, like how has that gone for you? So initially, I definitely took a defensive point of view. And especially with my family members, I was like, this is important to me. Like, I'm going to do what I want to do. And okay, bye, guys. (laughs) You guys deal with it. And they didn't understand. Um, And I started to notice that I myself wasn't feeling good. Having that interaction with my family members it didn't feel good. So I had to change. They weren't the ones that needed to change. And actually a few years down the line, that's how long it continued. I said, okay, I got to do something about this. I have to get out of my own comfort zone and kind of sacrifice uh, gym time or sacrifice feeling uncomfortable and go to these events because once I started seeing that nothing bad would happen, it settled my anxiety so that I kind of did my own exposure therapy um, and recognizing what were my limits without um, them impacting my goals. Can you explain what exposure therapy is? Not to interrupt, sorry. Exposure therapy. So that's... Sorry. There's there's different ways to do it. Um, So it's pretty much exposing yourself to the stimuli that causes the greatest anxiety for you. And there are ways for you to, like, completely flood yourself. You know, if someone who has traumatic events of, let's say, they don't want to fly a plane, they the initial therapeutic session would be them flying on a plane, but there's gradual steps for you to do that. So it's not completely shocking. Um, So I gradually started to go out more. I gradually started to interact more with people and maybe I would not go to the gym that day because this important event was happening. And I started seeing there weren't, any negative consequences from that. Like I didn't shrivel up or I didn't gain a million pounds from not going to the gym that day or eating at a restaurant and um, challenging myself to actually 
estimate macros and not be afraid that I'm going to blow it and, you know, I'm going to be not 100%. Um, yeah, just realizing that you're not going to totally implode from, you know, <laughs> getting off track. Yeah. Just That's really bit. interesting that um, I want to talk about comfort zones because they're, they're such an interesting paradox to me. Like hanging out in your comfort zone is in some ways the best way to get a lot of stuff done, to be productive. But it seems like the, the things you can be productive in or the direction of, of that productivity is only known things. It's only going to be in the ways that you, you already are, have done or can do. Um, like, for example, I will intentionally say no to stuff when I'm overloaded. Uh, like, like I have a, the rule for 2019 is I'm not doing anything more than I'm currently doing. You know, I've started the new podcast. I got masks, we got the books, we got the vault, we got all kinds of shit. I'm good, right? Um, and I've turned down a lot of things coming my way. And that keeps me in my comfort zone. It keeps me, my anxiety levels low and it allows me to dedicate time and energy towards doing the things that we're currently doing. However, the times in my life where I've grown the most as a person and gained additional perspective and been able to uh, relate to people more uh, or become more quote unquote resilient in my experience has been when I've been willing to push the boundaries of my comfort zone, but they're very different, you know, and it seems like you only need to do the latter when your comfort zone is uh, limiting, I guess. And a good example of that would be a bodybuilder who can't operate in social situations, can't eat outside of their own kitchen or, you know, all the stuff we've been talking about. But I, I, again, I think it comes back to, it's hard to self identify when that's the case. Right. Right. Yeah. So, that's those are two really good and it's taken us like a long time to kind of get through them and identify them and and get them at length but like when your friends don't lift right or when your family members don't understand what you're doing or when you feel isolated um the power of conversation has and then exposing yourself to the uncomfortable mm -hmm. is there right those are the two big ones we've talked about so far Right. Something I did also to help with that, with, with relationships, is um, ask people to participate with you. Hmm. People, people want to be included. People like to think of children. Um, kids usually want to help out in the kitchen. So have them, I don't know, you're baking cookies, have them take out the chocolate chips or something like that. So like with my mother, um, she has rheumatoid arthritis and for years I've been trying to get her into the gym and just do some activity. So one day I was like, You're, would you like to come to the gym with me? And she was scared because she knew that I was doing all these barbell and like dumbbell things and she was not able to. And I mean, I was fine dedicating the time to just have her go with me. Um, and that's kind of built our relationship more. And there wasn't the fear of the unknown for her. Um, just seeing me in my element and just having her be exposed as well, continuing the exposure therapy, <laughs> um, having her see what it really is. Because a lot of people, they, they don't, you know, they're, they're uncomfortable too. People don't know what they don't know. So they're going to make assumptions. They're going to tell you, oh, you shouldn't do this or, or that. But you can educate them. And that could be part of the conversation as well. Educate them about it and possibly include them. Yeah. I wouldn't have thought about that. Yeah, I mean, that's a great way to connect with people and for them to get a little insight into your world of what you enjoy, what you're doing, and to make it a lot more real and, and tangible for them. I think for the same reason uh, a lot of bodybuilders aren't great 
at stepping outside of their comfort zone is the same reason why the people who are most likely to be unaccepting of this big change in your life are are wanting to. And it comes down to control. Like Mm -hmm. if your mother or father or partner sees you in a specific way and they have a little box, like if 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 this is the Andrea or the Eric or the Amanda box, and then all of a sudden you're telling them, hey, guess where I'm out? I'm outside of the box, and they're like, oh, "I'm not. I'm not comfortable with that." Oh that, that, no, <laughs> that that does not fit my my like my whole worldview of having you be my my significant other, and you doing shit way outside of that freaks me the hell out in ways I can't even articulate. So I'm just generally uncomfortable with you doing this crazy new thing, and you changing, because then it means I don't know if I'm safe, and I think um, that's like Amanda. I I don't I don't know if if this is something that you see but people who struggle with disordered eating or body image issues it it often comes down to a need for control is that is that accurate clinically yeah it's one of the key features yes so yeah i mean that 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 explains why it's always about you know why social isolation happens Um, because if you like control and you know what you want, then that comfort zone is a really nice place to spend a good chunk of your life because it gives you control. It's not scary, and it, it doesn't it doesn't force you uh, out into places where you're uncomfortable. But that double edged sword of not allowing you to actually do other things than what you can already do, and your family might be family and friends might be very similar to you in some of those ways, and you might be part of that comfort zone and you might you have to realize that perhaps you're blowing up their comfort zone by saying that you're staying in yours or or going more extreme with it or doing this this new activity which i think is um i guess that realization in my my head would create a little more empathy between parties yeah man that made a whole new thing open up in my brain about uh like when you see on all the time on, on the internet, every like the the couple success stories of weight loss, or the when one partner does something, they both kind of do it and they take off together. But then, man, I got some friends, you know, because we've been all in the fitness industry, sports, or for a long time, and I can think of some instances where they're both overweight. One gets kind of hot and takes off, leaves them, you know. Um, and that made me think about how you said, like, uh, they put you in this box. And, like, our thing is we we met in high school and we gained 50 pounds together over a decade. And then one of them, you know, and that's, like, a thing we do together. And then you take that thing away. Um, I don't know. It, it, the, no, no. The it, predictability. In my, experience is, in my experience as a personal trainer, it's not like one person takes off. It's almost like the other person pushes them out the door. Yeah, so, like they resent your progress. Yeah, and or they're feel small afraid because of, of it. Yeah. So they're they're unsupportive. Um, it often comes from a place of insecurity. Uh, they 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 don't want to get on board with with changing the the dinners. So now you're you're off eating Tupperware on your own, and they're talking shit or making fun of you while they're eating ribs, or asking why are you doing this, or or something more passive aggressive and less direct. Um, or That's just not making life easy for you to work out or wondering yeah. why you do. And in general, being unsupportive in the hopes that you will stop because mm-hmm. I'm not ready for a change and I worry that I won't be good enough for you once you get there. And it becomes this, in my experience, it, it creates its own reality. Like if you're completely unsupportive of someone who's trying to change their life, that doesn't really go hand in hand with saying, and I'm your life partner, you yeah. know? <laughs> Oh, well, definitely. yeah, but I, as a coach, like I think about, I have a, it's a way small minority. Most of the people on the roster that I had the years I was coaching with 3D were had very supportive spouses, but a couple times, man, they did not like it. They're um, sabotaging them. Sabotage. Yeah. That's a good word. Yeah. Yeah. That sucks. They're sabotaging. So then it brings they're... the question yeah. of, uh, we talked a lot about how to include people, how to make these relationships better, blah, blah, blah. But I guess this is kind of also one of the few things I experienced in my first few years of being isolated in bodybuilding is it's, it makes it easier to push out the fluff in your life. Like there were also some people where I'm like, 
in, like, uh, okay, so say I had X amount of friends. Let's just say it was like 30 good friends. You know, let them all go away and only 10 were worth bringing back, really. And, and mm. shitty way to sound. But you know what I mean? Like, not that they were... Don't not, name names. <laughs> not that they're not my friends, but it's like, oh, these few were worth fighting for and some were just because I, I liked getting drunk with them like you know, they weren't actually mm-hmm. um you know so it's almost like like both ways um maybe you make this change for yourself and you decide like you said someone like your partner starts sabotaging you is this really a, was this a good life partnership anyways um yeah, I mean, I guess you're only going to have, in, in, unless your spouse dies or your partner dies, you're only going to have one relationship that works. In marriage. You know? Yes. In, in life, right? Yourself. Well, like, you're only going to have one person you who you actually stay with. And then, unless you have someone who dies, like, prematurely. Or maybe they die before you get married again in your very end of end of life kind of span. But married or not, but the point is, is every relationship you're in is either going to end in breakup or st- staying together yeah. until one of, one of you dies, right? <laughs> so, well, in a very serious sense. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Usually, 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 usually yeah. there are some usually poly- how it goes. Yeah, Okay, but yeah. Well, when when does it not go that way? Some people prefer not to have monogamous relationships. Is all I'm saying. Well, that's but you're still in a relationship with whoever, all all of the people, or the few, <laughs> or the many people you're with, or the one person. But it's an open relationship. But you're still with them. Okay. Right? Yes. Yes. And if that relationship ends, then it didn't work because you couldn't get on the same page about having an open relationship, or you know, it might have been two people and one person left. Like something about it didn't work. Right. Right. So I think in a very real sense, it's important to remember that like, yeah, it, every threat to a relationship is either an opportunity for growth or an indication that this isn't going to be that the, the one of the ones that works, right? right. Um, and that extends like it's not just a relationship with your partner. It's a relationship with Friends. all of your relationships are, are, are that way. Yeah. And I, I, as much as we're talking about the onus is on the, the crazy bodybuilder who closes doors and isn't aware of everyone, like – if you change who who you are to some degree and what your priorities are, there has to be some reflection in in your friend group and your social circle. Doesn't mean you you handle it shittily and just you know ghost them or or give them the finger. Right. But just like in a twelve step program where someone gets clean and goes, I probably shouldn't be hanging out at crack houses, <laughs> you know, with my diet coke. Like, no, it's all good, Tim. <laughs> you really shouldn't. You you do the crack. I got my Coke Zero. I'm solid <laughs> because we're buds. I think we had, we had a deeper deeper relationship than us breaking into homes and getting crack money. Um, <laughs> like, what do you do? You you eventually you have to separate yourself from uh, the environment that, that is not conducive to to your lifestyle anymore. And that might be like my drinking buddies or the the folks we would just get together with and drink and then go to Waffle Houses. That like if that's all the dimension to our our relationship was, and that's probably not going to relationship be a relationship that continues. So, I don't think that's necessarily bad. Yeah. Well, it goes back to the yeah. priorities, like y'all talked about a ten. Right. Mm-hmm. Priorities of relationships, priorities of your life, and bodybuilding can serve that purpose. It doesn't have to be all-consuming. It doesn't have to be, you know, you in this vortex with the blinders on. You can make it a positive. Yeah, mm-hmm. which I, I think the majority of the community is in that. Hopefully, yeah, um, yeah. I've seen I've seen that change, you know, throughout the years for myself. That I had that period of isolation and that uncomfortability. Like I, I need to do something about this. So then, reaching out to others, building my community, and getting rid of that fluff, Andrea, that you said of relationships that weren't really beneficial for me or they were convenient right like when I think about it man this is gonna fuck me up through this whole conversation (laughs) but it's like (laughs) the whole thing damn it um like we talk about preserving things that matter 
right? But we also say like, get rid of fluff. And what I mean by that is like those, at that time in my life, I really liked going out and getting smashed and going to like Waffle House, like Eric said. And I had some great buddies that we did that together, but then it's not that they were shitty people and maybe they could have been my friends. It's just like, and now I go to the gym. And so then I met these other people and that went so far to where this is my job with the people that I moved across the country because of bodybuilding to be by. Um, mm. And so, man, so it's like you cut these ties and move over here. And it's like, did I ever get better? I just go all the way further into it to where I did move and did work for free for 3DMJ. And now I'm part of 3DMJ. Um, You've also made deeper ties, though. Like, it's not like you, yeah. like if there is an underlying, and here I am going to try to play the therapist when I'm not one. Um, Amanda, just correct me. Well, if I'm yeah, <laughs> so, well, here's one thing is if there was like an underlying pathological issue where you couldn't form deep connections with people and when your life changed, you cut them out, you would expect to have the same shallow relationships now in bodybuilding yeah. as you did back when you were just going out and drinking and, and doing the Waffle House thing. And I'm sure, like you said, you have some of those friends still, mm -hmm. but they were probably the friends who Waffle House and vodka wasn't the only connection. Yeah. Like you might have also had yeah. deep conversations or got together for a brunch or, you know, talked on the phone. But yeah. for the people who all you do together is something that's no longer part of your life and it can't even if you try transform into something else, then, then yeah, that's not really a deep tie. But when you moved out to California, it wasn't just like you only saw us at the gym or yeah. uh, I shouldn't say us cause I wasn't there. But the point is, is like you have a deep personal connection that transcends the sport with a lot of the people you've met through the sport. Yeah, so I don't do that sport anymore, but here we are hosting a bodybuilding podcast. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, like, <laughs> And it's also, but it's also beyond, right? but it's also beyond your career. You know, it's not yeah. even, you don't just talk to us about work either. Yeah. So I mean, right. I guess what I'm saying is, um, and I'll bring this back to the listener. Like when I was first transitioning away from being, uh, your standard early twenties guy in the air force, which did involve drinking, um, to someone who was interested in bodybuilding, um, I was fine to go out. And I would be the DD. I'd make different decisions when we went to restaurants. Um, they knew that I wouldn't stay out too late if I had a workout the next day, et cetera. And I just expected and I had the um, the stance of you're all good. You do you. I'm going to do me. And where we can have it intersect, it will. Um, but the friends who did not want to respect that or didn't think, oh, that's cool. Eric's doing his thing. And they would – you know, try to force drinks down my throat, mm -hmm. get pissed at me or call me a pussy for not staying out late or any of that, that nonsense. Um, those stop being friends if I couldn't like talk to them about it. Like I would of course have a real conversation like, ha ha ha, but hey, this is important to me. And then if it was, Dick. then if it still stayed that way, then yeah, we're not homies because you actually don't care about me. You mm -hmm. like what I'm doing for you, you know? Mm -hmm. Right, which, which is not a yeah, it's not a relationship. That's just uh, I, I feel more comfortable when you're drinking when I'm drinking, and I don't really care what your values are. I just want you to drink with me, you know. So, I think that is I think you're right, Andrea. It is an opportunity to see which relationships carry depth and which ones don't. Yeah. And I think, how, how, um, did, how did I do, Coach? Did I did I do okay you, on you my did therapy? Pretty well, pretty well. You should charge, you know, half at least half an hour. Awesome. Do I get a license now? Am I licensed in California? <laughs> no. You heard it here. I'm licensed in California. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have the board. Well, I mean, <laughs> not to sound um, like I almost at this point, like I should have gone to therapy for some fucking things. But um, Eric, you're, you're like, uh, when I have problems uh, outside, like, you two are the people I go to and one's of you is a therapist and one of you has been in therapy for, I don't know how long you're at, 10 years now, something close to it in some yeah, capacity. Ever since my dad died was when I started getting into therapy. So it's been a decade now. And I think that's a testament. And also to the, raised by a marriage and family therapist. That's right. That's <laughs> yeah, there right. you go. Your mom was yeah. a therapist. But I mean, I think I that's a testament to what it, um, I don't want it to be like a commercial for therapy, but I mean for conversations like, 
Um, if the whole thing is like when your friends don't lift, do you throw them out the door, go away from them, not explain shit, um, have to get this whole new life with only people at the gym who fulfill your beliefs? Or, and it's like the, the, the big screaming or is like you talk about it. And if there's no one to talk to because you've thrown it all away, like you have to do shit. Right. Talking is just a form of problem solving. It doesn't yeah. need to be something really, I mean, you could attach emotions to it and be scary and not want to do it, but it's a form of problem solving. And that's how change can start to happen. Yeah. Or you give it the opportunity. Yeah. Um, something that was big for me too, I guess, before I, I understood that was I at least understood that being on YouTube and writing was very therapeutic to me. So that I think was the beginning of, I, I still didn't feel like I could have conversations with real people, but I reached out to the internet, which is kind of weird, but. Um, no, I think that's the same thing as journaling. It was a little, yeah. it's a little more public, but it's, um, it expands your options, right? It allows you to think about things differently than if it stays in your head. And I don't think you're alone in that. Um, when you think differently about something, it gives you a few more options. And there's, man, if you really want to try to think differently, enlist someone with a completely different brain, you know? <laughs> yeah. And, uh, like, like, that's the thing. Like, you talked to, I was kind of go back to that weird example I gave of people in fringe social groups who end up being part of violent or conspiracy theory groups. Like, they... They don't have anyone in their lives to go, hey, Tim, that sounds really crazy for <laughs> X, Y, and Z reasons. And have you considered this? You know, like um, having that can be really valuable because for whatever reason, like those blind spots are, are, are not open to you. And we all have blind spots because we only know what we know and can see what we can see and feel what we can feel um, with the given inputs we have. And you can alter that a little bit, like you said, with journaling or vlogging. Um, mm. You can, you know, get your brain thinking in different ways, but it's still your brain. And man, I, I know that when I, to me, anxiety feels like a loop. Like when I'm, when there's something that is really, really stressing me out and eating up my brain space and I'm obsessing over it and it's making me feel terrible and I can't sleep. I can't, I get to a point where I'm trying to think my way out of it, but it's just like pouring gasoline on the fire. And I just find myself like just racing around the anxiety faster and faster. Um, like I've just got my, my foot to the, the pedal and it's like, fuck, I need an off ramp. And that's exactly what my friends or my family or a therapist can be for me is for them just to, to help take the blinders off and go, you know, that you actually passed 10 off ramps, dude. Uh, and there's a lot of other ways of thinking about this. Um, you need to slow down, you need to take a second and hear this, if you consider this, this and this, and then just the act of talking about it to someone helps because I'm presenting it to someone else. So I have to frame it differently, but then also their feedback is incredibly helpful. So, um, yeah, I think just to understand the value of therapy, you have to appreciate your own limits. They're all forms of external processing because mm -hmm. therapy is about you. Um, you're not sitting there necessarily getting information from your therapist about them. They are facilitating the conversation about you. Mm -hmm. So just like journaling and talking to a friend and even a coaching relationship, it's external processing. It's a third party or second party um, where you just lay it out on the table and you you see externally versus inside where it's that loop, Eric, that you were talking about, and it's really easy to get caught in that. Mm. Yeah. Um, but I think y'all, you two both, um, on the phone, via Skype, at whatever hours of night, I've had to deal with my things as friends. Uh, but I think, again, that's that was a big thing that I was missing. Um, and I didn't even give 
my friends the opportunity to help me because I thought I was above it, you know? And I know that that, that happens um, a lot when you see the very angry, successful bodybuilders, when you're like, fuck everybody else, your dreams are your dreams, no one can hold you back, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, okay, but, um, and I've been there mentally. I think, you know, we all have, I know you have, Eric. Um, mm -hmm. But it's, it's like you, um, I can, I could talk to a camera and get help, but I wouldn't even talk, I wouldn't even try my friends or try my mom or try my mm. brother or whatever, you know? And I think um, that was the big barrier, I think, was I, I just thought I knew more than them and I didn't think they could help me. And it's not that someone has to be a therapist or has to be a coach or has to be licensed or, or no. qualified because obviously a video camera does not have a license and it helps me <laughs> or a sheet of paper. Um, but I always, I guess I always thought that. Mm. It's funny you mentioned the, um, the angry bodybuilders. And I think we all know exactly what you're talking about. The, there are no limits at work. Fuck it. Like the, the, I, I, I gotta, I gotta do me. And, um, you know, obsessed is a word that the lazy used to describe the dedicated, all that kind of that whole, um, feel. Yeah. There are times when that's right. And one thing I've learned in therapy is that the adaptations we make emotionally to deal with trauma or stress or an unhealthy relationship or an unhealthy home that we came from, they serve you as long as they serve you. And then eventually they may or may not. And that's typically when right. therapy becomes helpful, you know? Mm -hmm. So for example, if you grew up in a incredibly unsupportive home where you were an afterthought, everyone dismissed you as, as being incompetent and they didn't value you. And anytime you said you wanted to do something, they took a shit on you. There's man, there's that describes millions of people. Some people will just become totally introverted, not try to do anything and languish in obscurity and then become depressed and turn to drugs. Other people will become the complete rebel and use that for fuel, you know, and I think that's what we're seeing. And that's a very reasonable and actually productive adaptation to having all that negativity is to say, screw everybody else. I'm going to do me. I'm going to live my best life. Um, and it only becomes a problem <laughs> once you are hashtag living your best life, but you're still treating the world like you're the underdog uh, or like yeah. you, you're being bullied or uh, like everyone's out to get you. And then all of a sudden that combative attitude and that treating life like it's war, it becomes a creation of your own reality. Now you're receiving stress because you are fighting life because you're treating everyone like they, they're looking at you like the underdog or that they don't support you. When in fact, maybe tons of people want to support you, but you can't see it or you can't appreciate it or you don't know how to react to it. Um, so you don't form relationships around that. And the only people you engage with are the people who engage you negatively because that's what you're expecting. So you yeah. might have hundreds of thousands of social media followers all saying, you're awesome, you're awesome, we love you, we love you. And then one person says, you're an idiot. And then you spend your whole life for that day going off on that person. And, and I think we can think of a ton of people mm -hmm. like that. And yeah. it's really common in bodybuilding. Um, so, yeah, that works as long as it works. It's a positive adaptation. But at a certain point in your life, if you want to be happy and if you don't want to be stressed and if you don't want to dedicate time, energy and money uh, towards fighting, um, which almost never turns well, <laughs> yeah. then – then, then I think that's that's when you gotta start expanding your options, and it's difficult to do if you're in that loop. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I always, um, not just I know a lot of people, including myself, that have really prided themselves on independence. Like I don't mm -hmm. need anybody, and um, it's just uh, almost weak to think that you need relationships. At some times in my life, you know, I'm like I don't. I don't need that shit. See, I'm, Rizzo just moved across the country. I did that too. You know, where you're like, but I I think, um, and I say I didn't need anybody, but I think I needed my YouTube camera at that time, you know? Um, and you said it only works as long as it works. And I don't, I don't think humans are supposed to not have anybody. Yeah, we're, we're <laughs> I don't think we're, so either. <laughs> Yeah, We're biologically, media. but they yeah, don't like you don't need a shit ton of friends, but you need some people that matter. 
goes back to happiness. What I mentioned earlier, a component of it is having meaningful and fulfilling relationships. And that could be with a spouse or two friends or 20 friends. Yeah. Just It just means, you know, are, are they fulfilling? Are they real? Are they below that surface level? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which, in, 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 go ahead. No, it, which is what you found from moving across the country and not necessarily having all those Waffle House drunken relationships. Some of them were fun, though, but yeah. Um, <laughs> but it, I think it's it's just, it was hard. It's weird because it had to be like a gateway. Like, you wouldn't have told me, like, you need deeper relationships. But I was like, these guys know a lot about bodybuilding. They're going to help my, re- my career. But it turns out they're really great people that ended up, them and my boyfriend and everyone we were around or whatever, um, fulfilled a lot, like you said, a lot of other things for me. But I wouldn't have reached out there if it didn't um, start with the, they can help my bodybuilding. Mm. Um, I don't, I, I'm lucky that worked out, but I don't think it could have started had it, like I wouldn't have just gone up to random people who wouldn't be in service of my sport. They had to have done this first. And then it was like a, a healing thing because I found all these other things within it. Because it fell in line with your goals. Yeah. I, w- I also think it's interesting you found and chose and latched on to 3DMJ though. Because there's a million groups out there that have pretty good evidence-based content, are good at getting people shredded, would serve your bodybuilding career, and only promote success in a very narrow sense through bodybuilding. But we were very actively talking about balance, holism, you know, finding a way to, to transition between life, not losing your life with bodybuilding. So I think some part of you, I don't want to speak for you, but I think some, like you could have chosen other groups that are like, there was, there was literally a coaching team called uh, Team Dickskin back in the day. Hey, all right. <laughs> You know, like, and their whole thing was... How are they doing we, today? Exactly. <laughs> First off, Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, you were like, saying their whole thing. But how does their the whole thing was look promoting getting you so lean that that, that, that anatomical location was what yeah, your, you your body looked like everywhere, you know? So, like, it's just such right a... On. And, and there was a ton of groups like that. Like, you know, optimal coaching. You know, like, whatever. Like, yeah. throw two words together that mean get shredded or get jacked or be the perfect bodybuilder or, or like just penis. focus on the, the effort or, yeah. um, but you chose one that had the word journey in it, dedication, desire, discipline, and mm. all of us ran, yammering on about, you know, balance and, and doing it for, for reasons that were deeper than simply getting a plastic trophy. So yeah, there's some in there. Yeah. Uh, but you know, for, I guess for the listener, um, I don't know, maybe they're not comfortable with therapy. Uh, how would you, some advice, some parting advice as to how that they could um, begin this if we were to close it all out, right? Begin, how, like if, if they're isolated and they are, maybe listening to this podcast is like, oh shit, I am alone in this world. Maybe I should give a shit. Um, Priority list is how we start. Yeah. Would y'all recommend? Make a priority list and a values list. What's the difference between values and priorities? Priority is a concrete, like a tangible thing. Um, like priority, um, like I'm going to take care of this podcast right now. Um, work, kind of like a to-do list. Um, value is more um, family and... Uh, being honest, uh, like being, character having, having in t- character for there you go. That's the word. Okay. <laughs> Characteristics. Okay. Hey, what are my beliefs? Like I, uh, like if someone asks me what, what are my, my values, I think of, okay, what's the way I want to live that makes me feel fulfilled and that makes me feel like I am, I'm a good Eric. And I would put mm-hmm. like, you know, uh, integrity, um, trial altruism uh hard work or something like that would probably right. be among my top three or top five priorities would be like you know uh work family like, like, like balance yeah. you know being a better athlete pursuing my phd or whatever it would be at various points in my life mm-hmm. Perfect. okay 
and then finding the dissonance between how you're living and like here are my lists and I don't live like that at all. What's wrong? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Idiot. What do we need to do about this? Right. My actions versus my values. Okay. So are what is what you're doing currently matching up with your values and your priorities? And okay. that I guess is a, uh, your first, maybe a call to action if, if it's not. Mm -hmm. And if you feel stuck, um, then it would be like, like if this, if this is, if after doing those things, you'd see like, oh, the error of my ways, let me go work on that. But if you feel stuck, then it would be the, the outreach, maybe get a counselor, therapist, mm -hmm. friend. The external processing. Sit down with and someone. And if, if that is too much to handle or it's too scary, um, the journaling, like you said, um, talking to a camera could be the first steps, mm -hmm. uh, first exposures. Yeah, blogging. right. That whole exposure therapy thing. So put pushing pushing your comfort zone out just a little bit at a time. Just a little bit, yeah. And we I think we've we talked about some of the methods for that, like nutritionally. Like, you know, if you're tracking macros, just try protein and calories. Or if you're in the off season trying to gain weight slowly, try protein and body weight or something like that. Just little ways of, of learning, oh and I'm still okay. Oh when I'm still okay. Yeah. yeah. Right. You can even make a, a list of anxiety provoking events or things for you so you can mm -hmm. work up to it like in a tier. I like that. Okay. Like what so scares the flying, shit out of me? Scale of one to ten, right? Okay. Like so it's a not 10 just would go, be. Go ahead. It's not just book, book, book a flight on a biplane or a helicopter because I'm afraid <laughs> of flying. Skydiving like, next week. Sit down and imagine being on a plane to start, right? right? right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Watch Top Gun. <laughs> <laughs> go to a terminal. Things like oh. that. Okay. Very cool. Um, I guess one one big thing that we, we didn't talk about. We talked about in terms of relationships. Like um, you you said, Riz, like you, you need relationships to be a happy, functioning, social human being in this world because we're made for that. But... Um, I guess to, to those people, could we maybe talk about a few ways that doing these things will actually make you a better athlete? I mm -hmm. guess where it goes backwards and yeah. shit. Um, if you're not happy, st stress is higher, you recover less well. What mm -hmm. else, Eric, can you think of as a coach? Man, like having a support network. I, I, I just think of how... For if you look at bodybuilders who have a strong support network, who have people in their corner, who have a coach, who have competitors and friends they trust who they can go to, who have a spouse uh, or or a significant other or others, as you pointed out earlier. I'm um, just saying you could. <laughs> it's very possible. <laughs> the point is that if you have a supportive network around you, I think they they would tell you they do better because of that. In yeah. fact, we actually have research on qualitative research, but research nonetheless on like world champions in variety of sports who often quote, it takes a village, that kind of attitude. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have that, maybe you're leaving something on the table. Like most high level athletes in other sports certainly have coaches or value their, their mentors and things like that and their friends. So I think from the emotional support perspective, yeah, maybe it's not maybe looking at it as it's a weakness to need that is the wrong way to go, but rather it can enhance things to have it is, is, is a, is a more accurate description. Yeah. Right. And, and like you said, Riz, if, if a therapist or, um, if all that stuff see, doesn't feel right for whatever reason, I think any athlete would be like a coach. <laughs> and I didn't think about that, that you said that that could be one of the external feedback places that you go to. And, I can't imagine any athlete that thinks hiring a coach is weak or below them or that mm. wouldn't make it better. But like, um, you know, most people get a coach because they want this physical outcome in this sport, but it turns out, and that happened with me and Berto that, and, and I think about it too, like my, the athletes, the adults I looked up to the most when I was little were my coaches. Mm -hmm. Um, I cared about yeah. what they thought. So Your mentors. Yeah. So maybe that could be a good first step for a lot of athletes 
it's like if you need someone to talk to, a coach is, you're paying them to care. They do care. <laughs> like it's, um, you might have to pay them to listen to you, but that's how they get, that's how they do their job better, which makes you a better athlete too. Right. It's a sort of a therapeutic alliance, if you will, even though coaching is different, but, um, you know, the, but, the more information they have about you in outside of bodybuilding, the better they can serve you and adjust things, adjust training, nutrition, whatever it is. Yeah. Sick. Okay. Yeah. And the one other thing we talked about was, um, how to talk to people, having the stance of, right. In, in inviting them and considering their feelings and going into conversations without expectations versus confronting them with the reality of what you're going to be doing and the importance and either because you know best. Yeah. And either shape up, ship out, or you're not a part of my life kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Sweet. All right. I think we did a good job. Rizzo, yeah. where can people learn more about you or where should they contact you or all those things? Am I on the 3D website yet? You are, as this comes out, you are on the website. Okay. Then contact me through there, and my email should be posted. It is on there um, as well. Okay. Um, or Instagram, um, my handle is Rizzo, R-I-Z-O, Monster, all which together. Is my favorite, Rizzo Monster. <laughs> She's a monster. She is. All right. Thank you, guys. Appreciate Thank you. you. Hey there, this is Coach Eric Helms. Thanks so much for listening to our show. 3DMJ prides itself on keeping this show, our blog, and our YouTube channel as free and relevant sources of information for our community week after week. We also release additional free video courses as often as possible at 3DMJVault.com. If you'd like to help support our mission and our work, please consider becoming a monthly patron of our endeavors. Go to patreon.com slash team3dmj and donate just a couple dollars per month to our cause to help educate and grow the drug-free bodybuilding and powerlifting communities worldwide. You can definitely choose to donate more, and if you do so, we'll send you discount codes for future use on any of our paid products. But any little bit helps, and we appreciate your monthly support in any amount you see fit. So again, you can start assisting the team by going to patreon.com slash team3dmj. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Team 3DMJ. Thanks for sticking around, and we'll see you in the next show.